Hi, everyone. This is Charles Hoskinson broadcasting live from warm, sunny Colorado. Always warm, always sunny, sometimes Colorado. Today is July 30th, 2023, and I'm making a Blackboard video. Talk a little bit about Basho, the uh, era that is the most misunderstood. So let's go ahead and present my screen. Wah! Well, hang on. I got to wait for that. Wah! There we go. Okay, first off, uh, many of you last year watched the video streams that came from ScottFest. And there's actually a lovely 15-minute presentation here. Uh, it's called Driving Continued Technology Advancements Through Input Endorsers. And it's done by uh, Ekman, who's Chief Architecture at uh, Input Output. And they talk about all the cool things that have been done for simulations and a lot of the concepts that exist behind in Input Endorsers. Because a lot of people ask about this. So there's another video I'm going to show you in just a second, but let's talk a little bit about Basho. Yeah, here we go. Good old Basho. So basically, you have this guy, Bob. And Bob really, really wants to send a transaction to do something with Cardano. Okay, and that transaction could be a lot of stuff. It could be like, hey, I want to move money. Okay, so an asset. Uh, that could be something like uh, use smart contract. Could be something like I want to vote. Could be something like I want to make or register some certificate. Okay, et cetera, et cetera. There's many, many different use cases for Bob. So when you talk about scalability, really what you're talking about is you're talking about a bunch of different properties. Okay, so properties of scalability. So you look at things like predictability. So predictability means that when Bob wants to do these types of things, can he predict the cost? Can he predict the latency? Uh, can he predict the reliability? So you think reliability, if you do it 100 times, how many times does it fail? And so if it's 100 out of 100 times on average, perfect reliability. If it's 99, it's pretty good. If it's 20, that means it fails most of the time, 80% of the time. So you have different metrics of predictability. Cost, latency. Latency is how long does it take? Is that predictable? Meaning that we say usually it settles within this range of time. Um, is that the case or is it completely unpredictable where sometimes it settles in an hour sometimes it settles in five seconds it's cost predictable this is a single biggest driver for enterprise okay so then you have other properties of scalability such as resource growth under what circumstances do the resources of the system grow or contract okay so is it a finite pool system so you have this little pie and the more bobs there are the less pie you get for everybody uh, it gets divided and divided and divided so there's less resources or is it the case that the more bobs you get the pie gets bigger and you get a much larger resource resource pool for people so truly scalable protocols we generally think about resource growth that is proportional to the user growth. So as you gain users, you gain resources in the system. And resources are the things that are, and it's a ambiguous term, so generally speaking, resources are consumed from these types of activities. So 
the ability to issue assets, uh, use smart contracts, vote, put stuff on the system. Uh, and you can usually break it into three broad categories. And so you have network, you have data, so what you're storing, and then you have computation. So you can have a network that has a boatload of computation transaction processing capability, but very small blocks. And so it's very constrained. Or you can have a network that has a lot of data storage capacity and a lot of computational capacity, but it's very hard to move things around because you're network constrained. So when you talk about resource growth, you're thinking about something along these three axes. Okay, and you're looking for a sweet spot where they're all being maximized uh, and usually want them to be maximized as users are there. And you'd like that to be constrained within the lens of predictability. And then you also look at concepts like trade-offs. So as you embrace the growth of resources from users and try to establish predictability, you usually look at your decentralization index. So I'll, this is why we created the EDI um, and worked with the University of Edinburgh to get it standardized and create an independent metric because you want to be able to say, okay, say between zero and one, that your system, you know, X. And so the question is, you know, and this is less decentralized. I don't say more decentralized for a gross oversimplification for this video. But basically, you want to know am I moving in this direction or am I moving in that direction or am I staying the same? So there's all kinds of things that in could increase the resources of the system, but make you more centralized. And true research and development. Uh, what it does is increase the resource of the system, but it keeps you at the same level of decentralization or improves the decentralization, okay? Now, there's a trade-offs also have a notion of security. So usually, almost all of the high scalability protocols that we see, your Byzantine resistance goes from a one-half dishonesty to about a third, and in some extreme cases, a fourth. That might be okay for certain operating models, but generally, you have less security and less decentralization, but a lot more resources for everybody. And then you also think about egalitarian participation. So the more resources that you demand in a replicated sense, network data and computation, the fewer people that can provide those. So you kind of go from a raspberry Pi on this side to a supercomputer on this side, and this is on Wi Fi, and this is on fiber optic with a dedicated channel. Okay, like lots of strands. And that's the thing is if, if we pick this side, a lot more resources, but the problem is there's like five guys, and when they're not making hamburgers, they're making blocks over here. It's everybody and their uncle. Like you can leave your cell phone on and the charger and it potentially could be doing something for the network. So when we talk about scalability, the Basho agenda was really started as a research project to better understand these types of things. How do you achieve predictability? How do you grow your resource pool? What trade-offs are sacred and we can't violate them and other ones that are less than sacred? And ultimately, the end goal is to get more network data and computation because then Bob gets predictability with these things. And ideally, he wants fees to lower. Okay. So over time, he wants to pay less fees, faster settlement. Okay. So Bob doesn't want to wait hours for things to settle once faster settlement and bob also wants to have um 24 7 utility so when it works it's fast keeps getting cheaper and 24 hours a day seven days a week has access to the system alongside the uh 
Cardano established principles. I'll just start using that, CEP. So all the things that we know and love, like resilience and censorship resistance and decentralization, these types of things. So it turns out that when we started this agenda, um, there was no protocol, okay? And you have all these big marketing people, the Algorand people and the Avalanche people and all these other ecosystems, uh, Solana, they say, oh, we're scalable. Ah. No, there's no protocol that is a clear winner. And when I say winner, it means you get all this stuff. This always increases as people join. You get predictability. Your trade-offs are awesome. And uh, it's very egalitarian, meaning everybody participates. Nothing in 2015 or today completely satisfies all these things. Now, 2015 wasn't even a consideration. Today, there's actually a lot of amazing research that's being done by many different protocols and projects where they're chipping away at a lot of these concepts. And uh, we've made probably more progress, I'd say, than most but it's still an ongoing research concern. So here's what we've been doing today for Cardano. There's really four major items. Hydra, Mithril, plus plus. You got sidechains. One of these days, we should probably use a bigger, better term for that. So Hydra, Mithril, sidechains, and optimizations. Okay, so Hydra is middleware. It's on mainnet, and it's growing very rapidly. So uh, the release cycle is not like, oh, this big thing, it requires a hard fork. No, it's a straight up smart contract. And the idea is that a dApp takes Hydra and then it starts putting some stuff off chain and you still have the same trust and security guarantees uh, that you care about and you start getting some of these properties like predictability. And because these resources are local to the user base, usually you get a lot more things like very fast settlement, very low transaction fees, and they can be built in a way with high reliability. So you get a lot of good uptime and you're not really violating any of the principles. And what's so cool about this is this is uh, a, let me zoom out for a second. The Wacom tablet always does this. What's so cool about this is this is a fast, continuous, innovation. Meaning that it's a big open source project. Lots of people are joining it. In fact, if you guys want to participate, I'd recommend you go to uh, Hydra uh, Family. And this is the website for it. And you can see there's just an enormous amount of stuff going on. And if you go to the Discord, a lot of, uh, let's see how many users are there actually. 1,600, 1,200 members that are online right now, and there's 1,200 members, and there's a big chunk for the Hydra community. And then you go over to GitHub, and you actually take a look at the, the project. You can actually see here the roadmap. Uh, things are moving really quickly, and this is all the stuff that's already been released, and these are all the cards for various things. And so that's a fast and continuous notion of scalability. So it always improves the profile, and things just keep getting better. Now, you'll notice something on Mithril. This is really the beginning of data availability and proof systems. Okay. So this also includes a concept of rollups. And we've just released the first version of Mithril. And what's going to happen is Mithril is going to follow a very similar evolution to Hydra, uh, but there is some science here. So there's kind of a question of Mithril 2.0, and how should we go about building a good data availability layer for the system? Well, there's a great video that's from DC Spark, and it says data availability solutions overview, Chia, Polygon, Algorand, Celestia, IPFS, and Ethereum. 
and he does a really good job. And there's actually several videos here that uh, do a really good job discussing data availability in these uh, in these ecosystems. But basically, there's a there's a big research agenda here, and there's actually kind of a Manhattan Project style thing that we're setting up to to catch up on the roll up side, because the time has come to invest in some good technology. Uh, so there's several different firms that have come together, and we're going to have a lot to say about this at the Cardano Summit about some of the amazing things that have been achieved and will be achieved throughout next year to augment and enhance that. But still very big ongoing concern because there's a network consideration on-chain and off-chain. There's a data storage consideration on-chain and off-chain because you don't want the blockchain to blow up to 100 terabytes all of a sudden. And then there's a proof generation. Now, uh, Things like BLS, for example, are a big component of this, but there's other constructions that are needed, and that's coming in Plutus 3.0. For example, the very next version of Plutus, BLS support. So Mithril's on mainnet. There is a whole research team working on a much more efficient Mithril 2.0. Mithril's already amazing, and we can really get a lot more. Mithril's actually going to be an essential component on input endorsers, and I'll explain that in a little bit. Um, and uh, there's a lot of cool things that we're pushing into on the more complicated SNARK systems, the recursion and roll-up side of the world. Uh, and uh, that'll be real cool in November to kind of showcase all of that. This actually is also connected to the sidechains agenda. So sidechains, what this does is gives fast finality. This gives roll-ups. So there's a connection point there. Um, and this also gives uh, different models of transactions and resources. Also, a lot of traffic gets driven to the side chain, which means there's less load on the main chain. So there's some things that you do to get stuff off the chain. So Hydra, for example, get stuff off the chain. Uh, Roll-ups get stuff off the chain. Side chains get stuff off the chain. Optimizations is about better resource utilization while on chain. For example, Plutus 2.0, that ship with Vossel, you'll notice a lot of the DAP developers saying, hey, we've had a 10x improvement in terms of the utilization of resources. So a script that's a kilobyte now is 100 bytes. Whoa, that's crazy. That's a 10x. That means just much more efficient utilization of the resources that we have. So there's lots of iterative optimizations that are being done on the network layer, the block structure, the, the authenticated data structures that are used, uh, Plutus optimizations and other things, which gain meaningful percentages over time. So people get the same outcome, but they use less of the on-chain resources. It turns out that just with rollups and these types of state and payment channels, along with side chains to take the very high load things, it, it I believe very firmly that you know for about a two to five year window, as long as you're doing some optimizations, you probably can meet a very high rate of growth and still have a fairly comfortable network. Now you need to do some things. For example, we need babble fees here, so that side chains have first class citizenship with ADA, um, you also need uh, TX prioritization. So you, you need to have something like a fee market or tiered pricing to be able to help Bob get some predictability and uh, consistency in uh, his transaction structure as he goes through. These are not hypotheticals. This is a deployed technology. This is a deployed technology. Heavy, heavy work on side chains is underway. And come November, a lot to discuss and tell you guys about at the Cardano Summit. But I think people would be very happy. And there was a beautiful leapfrog. And you already saw with diffusion pipelining and uh, a collection of other things that have been done last year and this year that a lot of great optimizations have happened inside the system. So these are continuous processes. And while they require, in some cases, hard forks, like adding new versions of Plutus in to support proof structures, and also the fast finality is something called Paris, 
that's the next version of War of Boris after Genesis, uh, that basically gives you a finality gadget inside the system so you can have fast settlement on both sides, the main chain, the side chain, and side chain, the main chain. Babel fees also will require a fork, and uh, fee markets will require a fork. So there are some things here for the 2024 and beyond agenda, but this is a very easy to conceive of system. Uh, Hydra will continue its rampant evolution and for the most part will work its way into a lot of dApps that require scale and consistency. Mithril is already going to be a huge win for the wallets because you guys are going to be able to get full nodes that have fast sync. You don't have to wait three days for a node to sync and your light clients will have full node security. Well, that also works its way into the whole dApp consideration and there's tons of amazing things that can be done with data availability. When you look at um, more sophisticated proof systems, a lot of work has to be done, but now is the time to invest that. And there's a multi-million dollar uh, collection of teams, uh, Galois and us, that are working on that. And then on the sidechain side, it allows very high volume apps that need very specific logic, like the World Mobiles or Midnights or these other things to actually run, which takes load off of the main chain, but actually continues to use ADA as the underlying asset and continues to uh, create network value for uh, for Cardano. The optimizations continue. So really what Basho is, is to one part do this agenda, and then the other part do something big. Actually, let's even write it even bigger. Big. Okay. Big. There we go. Like Tom Hanks, I wish I was big. You guys remember that movie? That's an oldie but a goodie. Seem to have lost my, there we go. I hate the walk -em does that. Send me some suggestions on how to lock that shit down. All right, big. And that's input endorsers. There we go. Why are you doing that? Oh, this tablet. All right, input endorsers. There we go. So if you watch the video here, the driving continued technology advancement through input endorsers kind of explains a bit about how one would go from a single view environment to a multi-view. You could call it shard view state. There's a lot of different ways to cut this pie up. But basically the idea is that a lot of energy and resources are contributed towards creating this system where everybody has at any given time the exact same version of history. So right here at the tip of the system, uh, there's a lot of work that's a little chaotic, but eventually you reach some sort of consistency and then that gets added to the tail of the system. And then that chain ad nauseum will be consistent. So if you're following along, once it's settled, it's settled and it's there. That's kind of your single view. Now, the advantage of this is that you have very strong security guarantees and people can build applications against those guarantees and it simplifies the implementation of DEXs and other things. Now, it turns out that occasionally you have rollbacks and based, well, not rollups, rollbacks, and based upon the nature of the algorithm, like Algorand versus Ouroboros, for example, they have different views of these things. Some things have fast finality, and once it's settled, there's no rollbacks. Other things, they allow a probabilistic rollback. So that's why people have to wait usually some X blocks for something to be really settled. And I'll put that in air quotes. Settled is dependent upon your security tolerance that you have to value at risk. Okay, when you go to this multi-viewed reality, then what happens is that you, you kind of have this system where you have a main chain, okay? And then you have all this stuff 
that's happening off chain. And eventually you can take that stuff and you can reconcile it. Now the advantage here is that the outside stuff uh, can be done asynchronously and in parallel. Now the downside is that you no longer have this consistent, elegant view of history in the local form, but eventually you do in the global. So you'll see different terminology like input blocks and key blocks and these types of things. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, we want to do this because it would be really cool if you have your set of stake pool operators, your SPOs, and they work on different things. And so this group and this group and this group, this group, you know, their domain here, they're here, here, here. And eventually the threads all come together. But, you know, this thread is working on a different set of transactions and problems and this one this one that means that as you increase the spos you actually increase the throughput now a lot of stuff had to be thought about for example turns out if you use technology like mithril and also extended utxo that this helps you figure out how to do this in a way that it resembles this type of system especially as you zoom out, but you get the throughput of this kind of system. In other words, your trade-off profile, remember we always talk about trade-offs when we talk about scalability, looks more like this guy, what you're used to and you signed up for, but you get the advantage of a truly scalable system where you actually have an increase in resources. The problem is that there's a considerable amount of engineering on the network side, there's a lot of work that has to do rebuilding the consensus layer of the system. Um, and then there's also an incentives issue. So the incentives, what if we go from 1,000 to 30,000 state pool operators, for example? You have to pay them a little differently because there's all this stuff over here and there's stuff over there. Now, what we were able to do in 2022 is we were able to de-risk a design in a path, which is what you generally do in research is that you have a series of proofs of concepts. So for example, when they were building the atomic bomb, they came up with this idea of the plutonium um, implosion shell. And so they had this structure and then they'd have a plutonium core and then a little beryllium fuse that was inside of it. And they had this hypothesis that they would be able to implode the sphere in and it turned out they actually had to develop these really clever lenses to make the explosion uniform because it all had to be synchronized and there was a fast and a slow lens james von neumann came up with the design and the first thing you would do is you wouldn't put plutonium in that you would build the shell and demonstrate that you can have equal force on all sides with a synch synchronized explosion because you can't get that you know, there's no sense even trying to try to detonate a plutonium core so effectively, we did the same thing in a conceptual sense. We said, okay, what's kind of the implosion shell that we need to do? So there's a lot of simulations that were done, a lot of deep thoughts done about how to organize consensus and how these different colored threads would work and run in parallel, and a little bit of discussion of what a new incentive scheme would look like. And then the thing is, this has to be made interoperable with where we'd like to go with fee markets or something like that and fast finality and genesis and all the other things that we currently take advantage of in that single sharded environment uh here or wherever i drew it right up here okay so is this necessary to solve in 2024 well not really because the stuff over here is going to make cardano more competitive better faster cheaper add more programming models in and give many different ways to scale and these things are under the control of the individual DAP builders, the community, open source projects, and give an enormous amount of throughput potential. 
Now you want to get to the system over here because ultimately what this does is it changes your trade-offs from the constraint of the consensus algorithm itself to whatever the network is able to process and whatever the data layer of your system is able to process. In other words, it creates a system that enables scalability for Cardano uh, for the next decade or so. So there's an ongoing, very aggressive research thread here. It's called Ouroboros Laos. And they're making really good progress. Um, Paris is the high priority right now because fast finality is required as one of the last pieces to get sidechains to work really well. That same team is also working hard on Laos. And actually, Welltyped is the firm, that's Duncan's firm, uh, that did a lot of the historical modeling and is going to continue doing modeling uh, to better understand kind of that proof of concept of how this would come out. This is something that has to wait for SIP 1694 because it does change the trade-offs of Cardano. No matter how much of an advancement, it will have some implications on the monetary policy and the setup schemes, and it's going to be a different operating model than what people are used to. And it's important to have a governance system be able to understand the trade-offs, positive and negative, uh, for a system like that. So the job here is to get the proof of concept finished and have a very clear view continue the research to basically get those designs in place and then kind of let the community decide. When you look over here, there really isn't a movement in the trade-off profile. The existence of Hydra doesn't change what people signed up for with Genesis. The existence of Mithril and adding rollups into the language system, that's just better utilization of the blocks. And yeah, it requires a hard fork for fast finality, but that's a subset of the system where some SPOs come together and create finality locally so that transactions can settle, but it doesn't change your incentive structure, how Genesis works or any of the security guarantees. So that CEP, you know, the, uh, the parameters that Bob is used to don't change with the uh, scalability agenda. When you move to a completely new operating model and in input endorsers, it does require a different view because you're going to have to rebuild your incentives layer and pay the stake pool operators a little differently. And if you watch the video, you can see some of that. Um, and it actually requires a little bit more upgrades in the network layer and consensus layer. And there's a lot of stuff that builds up to it. Like it's nice to let Mithril continue to evolve because you reduce the trade-offs over here. Um, it's also nice to allow a pub subsystem to form and a data availability system to form because this can actually take part in that. And you have to guarantee that Ouroboros Laos doesn't, get rid of all the other guarantees we want for Ouroboros. We call this Omega. And Omega is basically all the fast stuff, but with all the good stuff. Okay, so bootstrap from Genesis, for example, Ouroboros Genesis, uh, the asynchronous network model, you know, Preos or better, you know, uh, Kronos, so the timekeeping components of it, the self-healing components of it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You want all of that with the fast stuff. So the work continues. It's actually um, a very big multidisciplinary project. Um, the lab at Stanford uh, is doing some of the stuff here. Edinburgh is kind of the nerve center of it. And Agalos is personally doing this research with some very good people. Uh, the design for Paris should work its way throughout the summer. And then the very next thing is Laos. And then with Laos, alongside lots of modeling, should have a direct line on site and a very good design for the system. Then once that design is in place, the community through SIP 1694 can decide if they like the trade-off profile and then input endorsers can be implemented through a series of upgrades and iterations. That is a parallel work stream to this work stream for Basho. And this one right here is already underway and you guys are seeing it. Hydra's on mainnet, Mithril just got on mainnet. Sidechains is very mature and lots to say in just a little bit about it. And optimizations obviously are happening on a regular basis. For example, you guys uh, note um, 8.0 or the Vossel hard fork with all the Plutus improvements that have happened. So a lot of people have strong opinions uh, one way or the other. And that's why decentralized governance is so important because those opinions really do need to be included and discussed. But I hope this gives some clarity. 
you know, when you see arguments on the internet, uh, they just get very brain dead. And I don't think people understand how these decisions are made. They have to really understand what are the properties of scalability. So what do you want to be predictable? What resources are you talking about? What is your scalability model? Um, what type of trade-offs are you willing to live with? What, what type of principles do you care about? Do you want an egalitarian participation? One of the things that I care a lot about is when we look at input endorsers, I'd like all this stuff that's happening outside that eventually works its way into the system. I'd like all that stuff to be something that a Raspberry Pi or a cell phone potentially could participate in. So that does add a lot more complexity into the protocol. However, it means that we leave fewer people behind. It means that more people can contribute, get a more resilient system. So input endorser is a huge long-term win, and there's a lot of very, very good ideas. Our critics will watch this video, hear absolutely nothing I've said, and say, Charles just said input endorsers is years away. And that's just unfortunate, just what, where we're at. And uh, that's just how things work. Uh, you know, uh, it's just like uh, recently I did an AMA. And when I did that AMA, uh, I was asked the question of what do I think of Algorand? And I'm an adult and a lot of people at Algorand are adults. And I mentioned that there's two principal entities. There's this corporation that uh, Silvio runs and then there's this foundation. And all of our exposure and work has been on the corporation side. We have great relationship with them, know the leadership there and have calls with them from time to time and we'll always find ways to collaborate and work together because we're adults and there's cool stuff that benefits both ecosystems. My experience for the foundation is they poached our John Woods and uh, we of course talk to him from time to time because we're on good and friendly terms, uh, but I've heard firsthand uh, that some of the leadership there has a very adversarial view of Cardano. I'm not sure why, because we've never really interacted with them and we don't view them as competitors. We view them as friends, at least on my side. But when I say that, you know, just to show you guys something, you know, if, if you go to the uh, Algorand official Reddit, this is what it compresses its way down to right here. Charles Hoskinson calls Algorand Foundation prickly, hyper-aggressive, and adversarial in recent AMA. Also calls Algorand brittle on the incentive side of staking. Well, it is. You have less than 10% participation. And my understanding is the, a lot of tokens are being created for a group of people to take over to create an incentive system. You, when you have 10% participation versus 74%, there are trade-offs and differences. Now, at least they provided a quote. But if you actually look at the commentary here, it's like you got to wait three to five years the roadmap with layer twos and sidechains to properly scale. That's what people say. And then, of course, they go to deep personal attacks. Like, Hosky doesn't like Stacy. I've never even met her, never interacted with her. Then I'm a lying narcissist, great salesman at the same time. Criminal decisions as fuck, argumentative con man, all these things. You say, I've never seen crap Charles. He's a snake oil salesman. Uh, and then, of course, lied about education, lies about something like triple down. Vitalik never said anything good. Oh, he didn't just do that. I guess he jumped out uh, with special forces in Afghanistan and all this stuff. Okay, great. Yeah, I got some land to sell you, too, if you believe that was ever said. His comments were mostly derived this and this. It's just this noise in these types of things. Oh, he praised Elgren several times in the past. This is a change in his demeanor towards the foundation. Again, it's when people, the foundation give grants and they tell the people they give them to that uh, you can't do anything on Cardano or these things. I mean, that, that happened. It's not a hypothetical, you see. And it just brings up a broader point about fiction and reality. You are adults. I talk to you like adults. These are very complicated systems. They require people with PhDs to really understand them. And what we're trying to do is break down the complexity and simplify it. And as we move towards decentralized governance, the community is going to be in the driver's seat about making the decisions of which protocols to select. And the engineers in the community will go and build those protocols, accepting that they're not always going to have the best trade-off profiles. You can always make things better, faster, cheaper, but more brittle. 
you can always sacrifice decentralization for centralization for the sake of efficiency. It's a much harder thing to do to preserve and protect decentralization and resilience, but actually improve the performance of the system. There has been eight years of research, probably about 30 of the 180 papers in the portfolio that we have um, is strictly about the Basho era, and there's been enormous wins. Hydra didn't exist as code three years ago. Now it's on mainnet. People are using it, and an open source ecosystem is growing around it, and it evolves every week. Mithril didn't exist until two years ago as a paper, and now it's on mainnet, and it's working its way into wallets throughout the year. The sidechain side of things, it's in the code side, and it's going to be on mainnet sooner than people think, and it's going to add a lot of dimensions of complexity to the system. And it's the same concept for rollups and availability and all these other things. They work their way in. And then, yes, you have to put things in like tiered pricing and Babel fees in some capacity and argue about what the trade-off profile should be. But every now and then you create revolutionary new protocols. And we are among the most cited and respected research groups in the world when you look at the raw citation count, thousands and thousands of citations for things like parallel chains and Ouroboros and all of the different papers, Ledger Redux, et cetera, that have been written uh, to talk about how one would go about putting a protocol together that moves the trade-off window so you keep what you want, but then you gain something new and you leave less people behind in the consensus process. Now, along the way, you can't get perfection and you have two choices. You can wait a little longer for science to catch up to give you something more, or you can make a trade-off and unfortunately lose something that you used to have. It's above my pay grade to make that decision, which is why Voltaire is essential, because it puts people in place to make that decision. And then the MBO structure, the way we're pro proposing open source development, it just becomes part of the product backlog. And then a bunch of engineers from all over the world come together and they build that and deploy that. Another thing is you notice with Solana, it goes down a lot. Why? Because they chose a different trade-off window. They built a model that's very fast, but it's very brittle. And it also has a huge toxic waste. Uh, that proof of history puts a lot on chains, a huge chain you have to keep forever. You don't know what to do with that stuff. You can't throw it away because it's part of your consensus but they hide that from the user because the set of people who can participate is very small. There are no Raspberry Pis making blocks. That's their decision. Now they did this because they wanted to be fastest in market, especially in a time period where DeFi was exploding and people didn't care about decentralization. They didn't care about operational resiliency. They cared about different things. That was a local short-term concern. Now in the long term. Did that benefit them? We don't know. It's for the markets to decide and for people to decide. And in five years or 10 years or 15 years, you start getting an answer to that question. The point is you don't know today. So when you try to make these decisions about decentralization, about scalability, you have to say, what is the easy stuff to do that everybody can participate in? And what's the really hard stuff to do that does require a lot of foresight, understanding that you're changing something that is very valuable. Cardano, our competitors never mention it, but it has been up for over 2,100 days, 100% of the time, 24 seven. It's a pretty remarkable thing for a large scale distributed system run by stake pool operators who have never met each other all across the world that's completely open where people are actively trying to hack and break it and to defraud it to be operational as an open system for that amount of time. Microsoft couldn't do that with Azure. Google couldn't do that. They have to control everything and create all this, this hierarchical stuff. And even st still, like every now and then Google goes down. It's rare, but you guys see it and people write articles about it. Cardano doesn't. This is what you're inheriting and making decisions around. And would you be okay with a system that goes from this TPS to 5,000 or 10,000 but occasionally fails like Solana from time to time. It's not my decision, it's yours. What we can do is show you the different options that exist, and then ultimately the community has to make that decision.
That's what real decentralization is about. That's what real consent of the governed is about. And that's what a real movement is about, is not thinking people are stupid. Don't lie to people. Tell people the truth and tell people the trade-offs here and there. What we can do with Basho is the stuff where it's ubiquitously better. No one will ever complain if you can do the same type of transaction 10 times cheaper with no trade-offs. But they will complain if you do it 10 times cheaper, but now you're trusting Alice over there and hoping to God that she's honest. Those are very different things. So we focused a lot on the stuff where nobody would complain. And once governance comes in, then you can start talking about the stuff that really does require judgment and wisdom. And input endorsers is part of that conversation. What we can do with good science and why we invested so much in science is try to reduce the scope of things that are controversial uh, through just innovation. And where and when that works, it's amazing. It's like going from coal power to nuclear power. Huzzah. Unfortunately, it doesn't work 100% of the time. Or you have to wait a really long time to get rid of all the trade-offs. And unfortunately, that means you slow down and you lose business. So the leadership has to make a decision what's good enough. So I hope this provides a, a little bit of clarity for people. And you have to get out of the Reddit. You have to get out of the Twitter. And you have to really think diligently and rigorously. And you have to really understand what trade-offs are. And that's why I showed the, uh, the video with uh, DC Spark about data availability and also the video that Ben did. Because they're talking to you like adults. They're talking to you like people. Uh, and laying down a lot of great ideas, a lot of great concepts. And they, they help you move forward. Um, we're still going to be in a highly tribal space, and um, that does hurt the ability for organizations to work together. Uh, that does hurt the ability for people to have effective and good dialogues. Uh, that said, uh, the people who are a bit more mature, they see past that, uh, and they see real value. There is perhaps no larger pool of scientific research in the entire industry than what has been created on behalf and by and for the Cardano Project. All of it is open source, and it has inspired many other ecosystems from Polkadot to Ergo and everything in between in some way to think a certain way. For example, Nipa Pow has just launched on Ergo. Super proud of that because I remember the early days of that research in 2016 uh, with Dionysus Sindros uh, working on it for his PhD. And to watch it go from just an idea in a Greek kid's mind to now the basis of security for like clients and an entire cryptocurrency ecosystem is an extraordinary accomplishment. So when people realize that that pool is a public good and the authors are willing to work with everybody, the adults in the room prevail. When people want to stow the fires of, uh, of competition and uh, rivalry and, and these types of things and just descend into a madness of ad hominems, it is what it is. My record stands, and it's very clear. And if uh, people want to say anything about it, they're well more than welcome to. It doesn't benefit them. Uh, we built a lot together. And the way we've structured things, the next 10 years are going to be significantly more productive and efficient and meaningful than the last 10 years, which went from nothing to a 3 million person movement. So we're here to stay. I'm not going anywhere. And this amazing research capacity that's been constructed isn't going anywhere. This amazing engineering capacity that's been constructed isn't going anywhere. And the decisions being made, uh, the designs being put down, they are really things that are designed to be around for decades to centuries. Because we view this as something nation states eventually want to use to run their entire economy. That is what you have now. And you have to make some decisions about where you want to take it, how quickly you want to move. And my hope is that the wisdom of the crowds will take us to great places. So thanks for listening. And I hope this provided some clarity on the uh, scalability side of the house.